Welcome back, everyone. Part two today of our Cabral host calls. Glad you could join me here today if you're listening in or watching live on Sunday. When the show debuts every Saturday and Sunday, we answer six of our community's questions each day. And uh, I'm excited to get back into it answering your questions. So if you're new to the show, uh, basically all of this is brand new to me. Each question that comes in, I've never seen it before. Uh, There's no prep time. What I do is I give you my honest answer from working in this field now for 25 years, seeing well over a quarter of a million uh, one-on-one client appointments, overseeing my team. I've probably done 40,000 of those. My team has course has done the rest and I help to oversee that team. So what I want to do is give you non-medical advice, right? Non-medical treatment plans, uh, non-medical cures. What I want to do is help you figure out the root cause of why what ails you is ailing you. And then from there, we can begin to rebalance the body to a healthy state where dis-ease in the body cannot exist. So let's get started. First question today is from our friend Justin. Justin is saying, hey, Dr. Brawl, does cold weather make you sick? My mother is paranoid about her body being cold even when she's inside. In being out in the cold weather, she's even more paranoid. She's convinced cold weather will make her sick. I've looked this up and could not find anything on it. Thanks. All right, Justin. Great question. Now, there. so keep in mind, Uh, not in India where it's warmer, but in traditional Chinese medicine, they were very concerned with coldness or dampness, especially in the North. And so what they would do is, I shouldn't say in the North, uh, uh, in traditional Chinese medicine in general, that this was a concern. So what I want to share with you is this, there is validity to this. So the Cold in general, they're even finding now, and that this is uh, this is actual um, new research, that consuming cold beverages weakens your digestion and may weaken your gut microbiome. Pretty interesting. Cold on your body is not that big a deal. Like, so let's say you do a cold plunge, a cold shower, a cryotherapy. Okay, it's short period of time, as long as you don't overdo it, not a big deal in those instances or when it, whether you're you know, listening to Wim Hof breathing or et cetera, because you're producing large amounts of norepinephrine, which is an immunostimulant. But again, people don't like to share the whole story with you. If you're exposed to chronic colds and you get a chill, so if you do a cold plunge and you get a chill, it's very bad for you. And yes, you can get sick because then that weakens your immune system. But if you're huffing and puffing and you're stimulating your adrenals and you're in the fight or flight, sure, you're going to be producing a lot of norepinephrine, right? And there's all sorts of different breathing techniques. I mean, literally monks have shown that they can melt uh, fr- like frozen ice or snow when they're sitting in the snow. So again, I'm not going to get too deep into that today. But your mom, it, she shouldn't be paranoid because paranoia and anxiety weaken the immune system as well. But they found that the secretory IgA, so the first line of defense, the immunoglobulin A, in the mucus secretions of the nasal passages can shrink and less can be produced in the cold. But again, this is if you are chilled, if you get cold. So if you stay in a cold plunge for longer than three minutes or four minutes or whatever your body can tolerate or it's too cold, yes, that actually weakens your immune system and you can get sick. Doesn't mean you will get sick, but it does mean that you can get sick. My opinion for most people is err on the side of being warmer, err on the side of being warmer. And if you're going to choose between a sauna and a cold plunge, my recommendation is always sauna for so many different reasons, but we'll talk about that on a different podcast. Doesn't mean that I don't think cold therapy is beneficial, but I just think most people are going to be uh, much more adapted to sauna and get more benefit. All right, I could go on and on about this, uh, but that is what I recommend. There's like a little caveat when you're sleeping, you want to be on the cooler side. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, you want to you want to stay warm, but you don't want to be anxious about it. You don't be worried about it. The cold air is not going to make you sick. You getting chilled can weaken the immune system. All right, phase up next. I'm curious, Dr. Brawl, you cured yourself of all your diseases. Doctors tell me mine is not reversible. I have uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. My pancreas is not producing the enzymes I need to digest fats, proteins, and carbs. I've done your labs and your protocols. However, I am going to have this continued bacterial overgrowth because of EPI. I'm taking 
a certain company's enzymes with all my meals. My pancreas is fine, not enlarged. My liver is fine. I still have gallbladder. I have no surgeries or diseases. I've done all the blood work, endoscopy, et cetera. I'm fine except for the EPI. My doctor said I was drinking more alcohol than I should have on a daily basis. It's been a few years now that I only have a few drinks on the weekends. I know I should have none. I've tried that with no change. My question is, can I heal my pancreas so that it makes its own enzymes that it needs? Otherwise, there's no point in doing anything more to get rid of the excess bacteria I have. It'll just keep coming back. I suffer with bloating and burping. Uh, these enzymes help, but it doesn't, but I don't really want to take these pills the rest of my life if I don't have to. Thanks for your insight. Okay. Yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from. I mean, this is somewhat akin. It's I'm not going to say that it's exactly the same, but it's somewhat akin to your, um, pancreas not producing the insulin that it would need in order to bring down blood sugar, right? So what I would say is this, is that this is not a black and white discussion. Like it's either binary, you're producing all of them or you're not. You're most likely producing some, again, I'm not giving you a medical diagnosis, but it's to the degree we don't know. We don't know if these cells, because I, I don't have any of your labs, I don't know. I mean, it seems like you're a very healthy individual. So I don't know if your labs are showing that these pancreas-based cells that are going to help with enzymatic production and moving those enzymes to the duodenum, the small intestine, uh, are permanently destroyed or not. I don't have the answer to that. So as of right now, like with type 1 diabetes, if those um, alpha cells of the pancreas are destroyed, you're most likely not going to be able to produce uh insulin, right? You're not going to be able to do that. Type 2 diabetes, different story, right? It's just a different story. You're not producing the amount that you should. That for sure is reversible, right? We know that. Um, so I don't know exactly where you're at. So what I would say is this. I mean, it looks like you're doing absolutely fantastic. So I just want to, I want to give a different, a different frame of reference here, meaning that you do want to get rid of the bacteria. You want to balance your gut. I do know what you're saying. So for you, what enzymes are we short on? And then can you be taking those? If you're a healthy human being, by simply taking pancreatic enzymes with each meal, then I know that this is maybe not what you want to hear, but I just want to share this with people. It may not be a bad trade-off, right? And again, like, because I don't know where you're at, but if, if this is permanent, but you can be a completely healthy individual by using these enzymes, then that's what we have to do. Like, again, I'm not, and I'm always here for you, and I always want to answer your questions, and I want to give you the answer that you're looking for. And I hope that maybe this is reversible, but I don't know, because I just have not seen any of this in your labs. So my, my, my question is, though, but if you can be a healthy individual, rebalance your gut, continue to take these pancreatic enzymes the same way that somebody without a gallbladder may continue to take ox bile, right, for their life, then I think we should look into that. I think you may also want to look into uh, overall digestive enzymes. You might want to look at using ginger tea. You might want to look at maybe a little apple cider vinegar uh, as a digestive aid with a meal if that doesn't bother histamine-based issues. Uh, you might want to use digestive bitters. Like any one of these can work. So what I'd say is, you know, sometimes we're, we're dealt a hand that isn't always the best. We just have to make our best of it. Like I still have in my genes mastocytosis, right? I still have mast cell issues in my body. They create, they can create lots of inflammation. So for me, I can't go wild with eating high histamine foods, right? I'm, I'm fixed. I'm cured. There's no more issues with me, but I still can't go wild because it's still deep in my genes. So I just want to state that for everybody is that, um, we don't always have carte blanche to do whatever we want in life with our body. But once we learn how to live with our body, we can live a pretty happy, healthy life. And so hopefully that's helpful. I don't know if it's the answer you were looking for, but um, at this moment in time, at least it's the answer that, that came to me. All right, Kenny's up next. Kenny says, hi, Dr. Brawl. A friend sent me an article saying that there's, a health, that there's health risks to taking melatonin. I take it at least five nights a week, and I know in the past you've spoken very highly of melatonin and its safety. Here's a link to the article. It's CNN, so I am very skeptical already. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. All right, Kenny, um, I know of uh, all the different many articles talking about melatonin and talking about sleep aids in general. The problem is this. These studies are showing oftentimes 
rat-based studies where they're giving the rats high dosages of melatonin. And the high dosage of melatonin would be equivalent to like 30, 50 plus milligrams a day of melatonin. You know, I know that you've listened to my podcast before, so you know my philosophy on nutritional supplements in general. We're using less than the human body would typically get on a daily basis. So that all we are doing is supplementing what the body may no longer be producing. So for example, let's say you didn't use melatonin and your cortisol levels continue to stay high and it took you two to three hours to fall to sleep at night. And because of that, you only got five hours of sleep at night. What would be better, in my opinion, is to get eight hours of sleep with very low-dose melatonin, because you know I only recommend low-dose melatonin, uh, than to get five hours of sleep, which has a much greater chance of leading to dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera, because of extended levels of high cortisol. So I have something called the sleep health protocol. You can, tell, you can start with magnesium first. You can start with adrenal soothe first. And then if that doesn't work, then you can do low-dose, non-groggy liquid melatonin which is exactly what I do. So the it's such a low dose. It's literally as low as you want it to be because it's liquid. So you can use it in dropper form. I like to use two and a half milligrams basically every night for myself. And the difference is dramatic in my sleep. It is absolutely dramatic. Will I use 10 milligrams a day? No. Will I even use five milligrams a day? No, only when I travel. So if I travel, like I'm about to take a trip to the West Coast and I want to set my sleep schedule how it should be, then I will use five milligrams and that's for a total of three days. And then it's back down to two and a half milligrams, which is one dropper. So I know all of the, I've read all the research uh, back and forth. Remember, people are trying to scare you. And they also lump it together with uh, prescription drugs. You can't lump the studies together with prescription drugs. That's crazy because prescription drugs don't allow you to get into the same deep sleep and REM sleep that liquid melatonin does. And again, you can track these things with something like an Aura Ring or another company. So Nothing wrong with asking these questions. I think they're great, and I'm always happy to answer them for you. So hopefully that was helpful. And again, keep in mind, be, be, I, I have no like. I think every media source is a little, you know, the the ones that are paid by uh, all the drug companies. You have to be a little careful, right? We have to be careful where that their funding is coming from. All right, Alicia's up next. Uh, I think it says Alicia. There's a J in there, but it might have, might have supposed to have been an I. All right. D Hi, Dr. Brawl. I love your podcast, and I've learned so much from it. I've had candida overgrowth and other gut issues that I've been working on. I've done a couple of protocols for candida and parasites in the past, but not yours, but still experienced lots of bloating. I take probiotics daily. One of the probiotics I take is Saccharomyces boulardii. I know it's a good yeast, but it's still a yeast. My question is, can Saccharomyces boulardii make candida worse? Also, I also had to take an antibiotic recently, uh, Rifaximin, or Zavaxin. Uh, so I want to bring good bacteria to my gut now. Will I benefit from S. boulardii, or can it make my candida worse? I just purchased the complete candida metabolic and vitamins test from you, and we'll retest for candida to see where I stand. I'm curious about the good fungi and candida interaction. All right, great question. Uh, really, for anybody who wants to fix their digestion, I have a course at stevencabral.com forward slash courses, and um, these are called Health Results Accelerators. So what I do is I condensed years of you reading dozens of books into a four and a half hour our course. Totally uh, op optional if you want to take it. Then I have all sorts of digestive-based podcasts that you can find at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast by scrolling right through. The problem is a lot of people have done a lot of different things for their gut. So had I for like a decade. If you are not doing the CBO protocol, you are not doing the CBO protocol. And I say that without ego. I say that without any hedge. It's just, it's not the same. You can say it's like it, but it's not. We were the innovators of digestive-based protocols because you're looking at one of the worst digestive patients in the history of the world. I had candida so far overgrown, it went in my stomach and up my esophagus and they could see it on an endoscopy. It was so bad. I had massive candida overgrowth, massive H. pylori, and massive SIBO. It, I went through all sorts of different things and it, you know they didn't work. It took years for me to formulate the CBO protocol. I literally give it, like, you can see the whole thing right there. It's right at stephencabral.com forward slash CBO. You can purchase it individually. You can work with your uh, naturopathic doctor, however you want to do it. But there really is only one. There is. And it's not expensive in the grand scheme of things. It's like $99 a month. I know it's $100. I get it. I totally understand that. But to my knowledge, it's the only thing that rebalances the gut fully. 
and it's systematic. So, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm really not. If it works for you and you want to do it, great. If not, I, I totally get it. Now, the answer your question about Saccharomyces boulardii, it is the only yeast that I know of that is actually uh, antagonistic to candida overgrowth, to yeast overgrowth. That means Saccharomyces boulardii actually goes in, pushes out pathogenic yeast, takes its place as a placeholder, and then is transient, which means that it moves out after two weeks, which is why we use it in month one of our CBO protocol. So it is a non-pathogenic yeast that does not fend, uh, feed candida overgrowth, does not make candida worse, and it actually helps improve it. All right, hopefully that was helpful. Looks like we've got another one from Alicia. Alicia says, hi again, Dr. Brawl. And it might be Alicia, um, and, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Hi again, Dr. Brawl. I would love to ask you about the medicinal mushrooms and candida overgrowth, chaga, rishi, lion's mane, turkey tail, cordyceps, et cetera. Can they be good for a person with gut imbalances and candida overgrowth, or will they make my condition worse? Thank you so much for your answers. Lots of gratitude and love towards you and your family. Thank you, and same to you. So this is a great question. Um, we... Uh, so you're running the candida metabolic and vitamin test, which is fantastic. That's the number one lab to figure out your candida overgrowth. So you're going to get all of this from your health coach, by the way. Um, but we have a product called Daily Mushroom Immune Support. It's an amazing product. It is a loaded product. Like we're talking about real clinical dosages of medicinal mushrooms. However, we do not recommend mushroom products for people dealing with candida overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, or mold overgrowth, okay? We do not recommend them until the gut is balanced. Then when the gut is balanced, then they seem to do very well. But we do not want to exacerbate anything during at least the first six to eight weeks of the CBO protocol. Then after that, sure, we can start to add them in if you choose. Now, the one exception to that, believe it or not, is reishi. I've spoken about this before. Reishi mushroom actually seems to have benefits even for those with candida overgrowth or mold overgrowth, mainly because of its immune O modulating potential. And again, have to give a disclaimer, no medical advice, right? No medical treatment plans here are being given. Um, so that is it. For me, I would just say, let's keep things simple. Honestly, you're going to do something like the CBO protocol plus the citricidal. You're going to be using a daily nutritional support, most likely omegas. And um, we just don't need to do the mushroom extracts right now. All right. So hopefully that's helpful. Elizabeth is our last question of the day. She's saying, hi, Dr. Ball. Thank you for your wonderful wisdom. I have been a faithful follower for many years. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. Thank you for the kind words. My daughter was diagnosed with uh, Chiara, Chiari, Chiari 1 malfa mal malformation at age 2 about four years ago. After fall, that required a CT scan due to persistent concussive symptoms. We had an MRI one year ago that showed interval development of the syrinx because of the higher probability that it may cause irreversible uh, paresthesias and or chronic pain, we decided to have compression surgery in an attempt to reduce the pressure in her spinal cord. She has had a follow-up MRI in the past six months, which has not showed much improvement in the size of the syrinx. Wanting to avoid surgery again, I'm curious as to whether you have any recommendations, not curious diagnosis or treatments, to improve her symptoms. We are currently in PT due to her low muscle tone and poor condition. I also give her a high quality multivitamin, D3, K2, omega daily. How would you treat this if it were your daughter? Thank you again, Elizabeth. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth, for writing in. Totally feel for you. Totally understand where you're coming from and love everything that you're doing for your daughter. I know she's in good hands with you. Um, this is not something that I specialize in. I think we are talking about, because again, I don't go in, do in-depth research on this. I think we are talking about uh, a malformation of the skull where the brain is basically... Uh, the skull is not allowing for enough room for the brain to continue to grow. And because of this, there is swelling and uh, that may then lead to inflammation and other issues, especially like in the motor control region uh, in the cerebellum. And maybe that is why we're talking about spinal cord issues as well. So essentially, there's too much crowding of the brain. So in these particular issues, which it happened due to an accident, due to a fall, 
My highest recommendation is to look at everything in the human body for your daughter that may be imbalanced. You're already doing omega-3s, which I think is amazing. Just keep in mind with any surgeries and like that, it does act as a blood thinner. So of course, always tell your medical doctor. Um, you're doing vitamin D3 with the K2. If you're using the daily nutritional support, it already contains the K2 in it. So it's just something to think about. You, wanna, you don't want to overdo the K2 because it's another fat-soluble vitamin so that you're doing great there. You're doing a high-quality multivitamin. Um, hopefully, it contains vitamin C. If not, you might want to get a little bit of vitamin C in there. That would be maybe one recommendation there as well. Look at the overall gut. If the gut function, you could just run a candida metabolic and vitamins test if you wanted to. Maybe the starter kit to look at heavy metals as well. And then what you're doing is you're looking at everything that, cause, that could cause inflammation. So my goal, if I were helping you, which I am, uh, but again, non-medically, as we just said, uh, it would be to look at all the causes of inflammation in the body that could lead to systemic inflammation, which could then be brain inflammation as well. So you're going to work with your natural health team, and you're going to work with your uh, medical doctor specialist, and that will absolutely be the best way uh, to give your daughter everything that she needs. And, and I have no doubt she's going to do great. She's in great hands with you. Uh, keep making sure that you're always, you know, question everything, but not being obviously uh, rude or anything like that to any of the doctors. But you're just making sure that you're always seeking out second opinions, that this is the right thing for you, your family, your daughter. And, and I know that you're both going to do great. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for writing in. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your support. Thank you so much. And I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of our Mindset and Motivation Monday. Don't miss it. 